Uh, you know, I think I get hit on more now that I look like this than I did when I had a full head of jet black hair. <laughs> What's your wife think about that? Honestly, I think it turns her on. <laughs> This is episode 203 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and there really wasn't a whole lot of news that happened in the whiskey world from our major distillers out there, so I figured let's look at some highlights of recent news articles and videos from the past week. Fred Minnick, you know him as another host on here, but he also has his own YouTube series called The Curation Desk. Sometimes it's about bourbon and rum reviews, other times you get just good nuggets information, and this past week he released a video on a very unusual topic. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it involves an illegal activity that accounted for more American whiskey sales that then in turn led to the temperance movement in the mid-1800s. You're going to really enjoy this one, so make sure you go and check out the link in our show notes. Friend of the show, Chuck Cattery, came out with his list of his favorite bourbons of all time. Only six top this list, and most most of them are unicorns. Very, very old Fitzgerald, Parker's blend of mash bills, but there's a surprising one on there, and that's Wild Turkey's Kentucky Spirit. Yes, the widely available and abundantly on the shelves Kentucky Spirit. You can read all of his tasting notes plus the entire list within our show notes as well. You heard me talk about on the show two weeks ago, but we have now opened up our recent Pursuit series bottlings to the public. Episode 10 is one we're super excited for. It's our collaboration with Finger Lakes Distilling. It's a five-year weeded mash bill bottled at barrel proof, and as much as to our knowledge, it is the only one in existence that's out there. It tastes like you're chewing on a piece of juicy fruit gum, so you're going to notice a subtle nod to that in our show notes. And this is priced at $65. Episode 11 is like a salted caramel coming in at 10 years from our Tennessee stock of bourbon, and it's priced at $75. The links to pick these up are in our show notes, and you can read more about them at PursuitSpirits.com. We've recently sold out of episode 6 and are running very low on episode 7, so don't sit around and wait for these. Today's guest gets more FaceTime than The Bachelorette. He's built up a big fan base amongst weather geeks and now Jim Cantore of The Weather Channel, joins Bourbon Pursuit to talk about his career, braving those crazy storms you see in viral videos, and how weather patterns and global warming are starting to affect today's bourbon stocks. We also get to hear a funny story shared by Jim and Fred as they were drilling barrels together at Jack Daniels. This episode gives you a look into Jim's everyday life and how bourbon became a part of it. As a side note, this was a very timely episode. This podcast talks about the current climate and how Jim predicted the current tornado outbreak that's affecting Oklahoma in the recent weeks. And our thoughts and prayers are with the families affected during this time. But with that, let's hear from our good friend Joe over at Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hi, this is Joe from Barrel Bourbon. We blend and bottle at cast strength, just as nature intended. You can find it on the shelves at your nearest retail store. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. I'll never forget this moment. I was in a room in Cognac, France, with a bunch of spirits professionals. The fire was crackling. We were drinking some fresh Cognac out of the barrel. And we started debating how Cognac was marketing itself. We all had some type of criticism for how that they were pursuing new markets. And we all love cognac. And to this day, I love cognac. It's a wonderful brandy. And one of my big criticisms was around Louis, the the Louis the 13th bottle. It's like $1,500 to $5,000. In Las Vegas, it's a $15,000 bottle. And it's in this beautiful, you know, crystal decanter that really does look like it's fit for a king. But we don't know what's inside it. The cognac maker, you know, Remy Martin, never really revealed what was inside the bottle. That was 10 years ago. And today, we're starting to see that happen in bourbon. You're seeing these fancy, fancy bottles come out. Nice decanters 
really crafted and just look ornate and beautiful. Woodford Reserve just came out with one, a, a back wrap bottle. It's uh, going for $1,500. Now, Brown Foreman is always uh, transparent about what's inside the bottle, and they were transparent with this as well. But no one's really spending $1,500 to get the whiskey. It's for the decanter. And I, to this day, think that those decanters, while nice and they're very decorative and they add a nice little element to, to the home, I think they devalue the whiskey a little bit because when you are buying something for the bottle, you're not buying it for the whiskey. So there's got to be a happy medium. How do we get past this desire to attract the ultra rich without stabbing the regular guys in the eye? You know, I think there's got to be a happy medium. But how do we get there? Do we lessen the decanter? Do we put better whiskey in the bottle? I don't know. But I do know this. When I see a $1,500 decanter of American whiskey, it leaves a really bad taste in my mouth. And I haven't even tasted the bourbon yet. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, like someone did for this one, hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. That's at Fred Minnick. Again, that's at Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Fred here today talking about, uh, talking to a person that's in a business that kind of affects a lot of what happens inside of bourbon in itself, because we talk about Kentucky bourbon really making an impact and really how the climate here makes it happen as well. But, you know, we're not going to talk about just that. We're going to talk about the personality behind the person that's here today. And I know Fred has a pretty good story and history about how we came to know our guest today as well. Yeah, that's that's right, Kenny. Uh, so we're we're joined today by the great Jim Cantori, of course, the the man you don't necessarily want to see in your town because if he's there, that means bad weather's coming. And um, we were uh, judges together on the uh, Jack Daniels uh, barbecue competition a couple years ago. And we really just kind of hit it off and just had, uh, you know, we just started talking whiskey and weather and other things. And, um, you know, I've, I've met a lot of, a lot of interesting people in my life. And, you know, Jim's one of those people that uh, just, it, it kind of stuck. And I'd say we've remained friends and I get texts three o'clock in the morning, wanting to know if a particular <laughs> whiskey's any good. And he gets, he gets oh, texts from me man. about like, you know, should I take cover, uh, for this little raindrop coming down, you know? So, uh, it's fun, Jim. It's really great to see you. Thanks for coming on a bourbon pursuit. Absolutely, brother. Um, yeah, I, th I think I got a text from you about 20 minutes ago saying, are you ready to go? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to go, man. Next Wednesday. Sounds good. We talked about five o'clock. I'm ready to go. He goes, yeah, you know, actually it's this Wednesday. Yeah. I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> so I'm in traffic trying to get home and, uh, well, Jim, I apologize for Fred. We're we're working on his calendar. We're getting oh, exactly. better with it. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. I, yeah. I haven't had time to go back and check to see if it really was next Wednesday or it's, this Wednesday. It's but probably I best you don't do things. that. It's probably best. Gonna, this is what I do, man. I research <laughs> things. So, this, so there you go. Well, I, I got to tell you too. In Atlanta traffic is oh geez. that's kind of like real traffic, unlike Louisville. You know, you guys, you get murdered there on the traffic. Uh, it's awful. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting with all the movies and things now they do in, in Atlanta. It's almost like with the movies has come the tra the L.A. traffic into Atlanta. It's it's really weird. But, you know, one of the mistakes they made years ago was not putting an outer loop in a city of six to seven million people. No. So not having that outer loop means you've got all sorts of commerce coming down from North Carolina, uh, up from Florida, you know, from westbound in Alabama into Georgia and, and everything kind of meets in the middle on this little thing called the perimeter in Atlanta. And I mean, it's just incredible. And when you throw a little snow in the mix, whoo, gets real fun. How do, how do folks in Georgia handle the snow? Well, they all leave work at once, Fred. And um, <laughs> I mean, I guess that's human nature at, at the end of the day, because people are like, 
all right, wow, it's snowing. Uh, it's here a little earlier than they told me it was going to be. So I need to get on the road. I need to make sure I get home. But of course, as they're getting on the road, so is everybody else. <laughs> and, and, and so all that commerce is still coming through Atlanta and it just locks up the whole system. Uh, we had, we had snowmageddon a few years ago here and That's people right. spent like 20, 24 hours in their vehicles, uh, just gridlock. I mean, I've seen news stories where people are like abandoning their cars on Atlanta's freeways as well. I mean, that's happened in the past too. Well, they did. And you know what? I I don't want to just say this is Atlanta's problem because I've seen it in Raleigh. I've seen it in Charlotte. I've seen it in Nashville. I've seen it in New York City. Uh, Okay. I mean, I've seen it in St. Louis just recently. So, I I mean, it's just we have to have a, a better plan of when we shut down. I mean, you know how we are as humans, man. We want to push it to the edge. And then, okay, we can execute our plan. It doesn't always work that way. <laughs> Sometimes you got to be early and take your lickings if the forecast doesn't verify. And, I, and I'd rather be on that end of it than the end of it with, with mom picking up, you know, her daughter or her son at the daycare or dad, whoever's picking them up. And, and they're crying because now they can't get home. And there's yeah. no food in the car. There's nothing to back you up with. So, so those are the, the human stories, the human part of that, that, uh, that I hate to tell, but it happens. Well, let's, let's get into like how you got to where you are. Um, you are one of the most fascinating social media follows, uh, for anybody who's interested in weather. Tell us how you got involved in weather, where, what was the moment that made you want to be a weatherman? It was, it was all my dad. Um, you know, we sat down at the dining room table and he, he came up to me and he said, I, oh, I was sitting down. He, he was standing uh, and he looked down at me. He goes, son, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? I said, I don't know, dad. I mean, I love electronics, uh, electrician, a fireman. I mean, those are, uh, that's what I'd like to do. He goes, he goes, look, he goes, you need, you need to go study the weather. You're like a freak when it snows. All right. You leave the barn light on. You wait for the first flakes. You go shovel the walkway so your mom can get to work in the morning, you know, you got to wake up for the next 50 years of your life every day to go to work. You better love what you do. You love the weather. Go study the weather. Boom. That was it. And that was, that was before the weather channel, right? And before. um, Yeah. So he said that to me in 82 and that's the, interestingly enough, that was the birth year of cable. Yeah. uh, And a lot of it in Atlanta uh, because of the, you know, the relatively mild weather with the exception of snowmageddon, uh, the fact that you needed, uh, you know, a 365, 24, seven workforce, uh, you know, low cost of living. I mean, all those things kind of played into cable's role, certainly. And I think Atlanta certainly being the birthplace of cable, but yeah, we, I remember in 86 when I graduated four years later and, my brother came up to me. I was up on a scaffolding painting a building. I had just graduated college and he goes, Hey Jim, the weather channel wants to talk to you. And I'm like, Oh wow. The weather channel. Cause we had just gotten them on, on cable. Mm-hmm. So when I started, we were in 28 million homes and at the weather channel's peak, uh, we were about in 108 million. So I got a chance to really go through that tremendous growth period, uh, with the weather channel company. And it was just, I mean, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Wow. One of the best parts of my life, man. Really. When you when you people. were when you were first when you first started there, what were you drinking? Oh, dude, beers. <laughs> we're low, we're, we're cheap beers. Okay, because <laughs> I wasn't making a lot of money. <laughs> Are we so, talking? Yeah, so I went from Mil- So, Fred, I went from Old Milwaukee in college. Okay. Can you believe? Yeah, sorry, bro. I got to be honest with you. Yeah, oh, we can. We can Miller believe Light, it. Michelob Light. It's crazy. All right. So when did you when did you start drinking whiskey? Uh, probably about forty five. I'm just kind of late bloomer, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like okay, so I started playing golf at about thirty years old, and and you know after golf, it's so nice to just go having uh, a drink. And it actually it kind of started with scotch, and then you know somebody said, "Oh, try this single beer." My dad was a big scotch drinker. So I would go home and see him. And, you know, as he aged, it was kind of nice to just sit down and have a drink with my dad and drink what he was drinking. So I found this old bottle. My grandmother used to work for a uh, liquor store distributor. Mm -hmm. I found this old bottle of Four Roses. 
I'm like, Dad, why, why aren't you drinking this? He's, I don't know. It's been sitting there for 20 years. So I, I popped it open, and you know, the cork was just a disaster. I mean, it, it was shattered. So there's like, so I just pushed it down in there, and I started pouring it out. And there's cork in the glass. But I took one sip of that, and I'm just like, ooh, this is my drink. Wow. You're, so you're pour, the scotch drinker. I'm the bourbon drinker. So Four Roses is is the bourbon that uh, turned your scotch palate into a bourbon palate. Yes, sir. Ah, that's awesome. Fred, do you think that's a little unique in its, in its sense, too? Because, I mean, I know that both of you and I, we've tried older Four Roses, and some of it might not even compare to today's Four Roses in regards of, like, the quality that had been put out back then. Well, here's the thing is like I would want to see the bottle because there were um by by him describing it as having a cork, that makes me think it might have been what what was are we talking nineties? Was this in the mid nineties? Oh gosh. This this bottle was probably from the sixties. Oh okay. wow. But when did you when did you have that taste? Um Yes, 90s. So so it's been in the 90s. Um, so if that bottle was from the 60s, you know, do you recall any like uh, foreign language on it by chance? Was there no, any? It, it was clear. <laughs> American. It, it was. <laughs> there were, there He's was, asking it, if it was, it was, it was a Japan. Really unique bottle yeah. because it was shaped like a, like a pyramid almost. Okay. So then what you had then, you actually, so uh, Kenny, he did not have a a blend as you as you were thinking. He had um, I actually think that you had a, a single barrel from one of the first single barrels from Four Roses as they really? were making their comeback, and it was actually from the nineties. Uh, I do have a bottle in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> really, I don't think we're going to find all those yeah. boxes. Yeah. Good, uh, good but, luck finding that, Fred. Just. Do you want to take a few minutes or you want to pause? <laughs> yeah. What do you, what do you, what do you want to do? Time out. Time out. Hold on. I, Fred, I, yeah. I need a drink. <laughs> but uh, the way, the bottle you're describing, did it have a green label? Do you recall? It didn't have any label. Didn't have any label. Uh, uh, so, so you know what? So I will, will be willing to say it may not have been Four Roses, but the fact that my grandmother was a distributor and we had Four Roses glasses, shot glasses, Four Roses everything, I, I'm wondering if, if – uh, if that was it. And I certainly, you know, recently the comeback of four roses, mm -hmm. as we, as we all know, has, has been huge. Um, so that's been kind of a bright spot. And that's what my girlfriend drinks. Nice. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that later. That was yeah. girlfriend drink. <laughs> but, but you, but the bottom line is there was, there was a bourbon in the nineties that brought you, you know, to where you are now. And what, after you had that taste, what were you uh, seeking out in the store and at the bar? You, you, you and I have talked before a little bit. I, I love grain. Um, I love a little candy corn. You know, I love a little caramel. And I, I just, I love the, the, just the front end. When, as soon as it like hits my lips, it's just, it's just delicious. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know what? I started like smoking cigars. And the cigar became a great thing with the bourbon. This even makes it taste better having a cigar. So especially, you know, especially not an overpowering cigar, just a, just a lighter, medium bodied cigar. But that's, that's kind of how it all got started. That seems the, like it lead it down dream. the path of sin over here is what's starting to lead you down over here. <laughs> well, yes. And, you know, meeting Fred certainly didn't help any, <laughs> but uh, that's life. So I remember, I remember walking, um, down uh, Lynchburg with you and like every fifth person, someone would stop. Oh shit. There's Jim Cantori. <laughs> is there a tornado a coming? You know, or is there a hurricane coming? You know, everybody like they would see you and they would be a, a, a little afraid of what was coming. What's, what's the strangest thing someone has said to you in public? Uh, can you sign my breast? Uh, that's a new one. Fred, has anybody yeah. ever said that to you yet? Yeah, no. and, and, and I'm just like, no, I can't. Um, so yeah, I don't do body parts or or dollar bills. I don't deface the dollar. So th those are the two things that I, I won't sign. But everything else is pretty much fair game. <laughs> <laughs> I 
you don't have a piece of like weather related equipment. Minnick, you don't have an answer for that, do you? You were not expecting. <laughs> I wouldn't. No, I wasn't. That was, I know you were. That's okay. I, 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 I was. I was expecting you know something you know, a little bit more weather related versus signing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, here, brand. sign this snowflake for me. Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll get on that. Do you um, do you ever get like annoyed that people have you associated with? Uh, basically disasters because that's all you do. You I mean you chase disasters for a living? Yeah. So when I did when we were working with NBC, which was just wonderful. Oh, I loved our relationship with NBC, especially with NBC Sports, because I got to do the Olympics, I got to do the Winter Classic, Super Bowls. It was just so it it was like being a part of a team, like a sports wow. team. You know, um, they they ran that show like. You, you had a role. It was in it. We treated everything like an event and it was really amazing. We rehearsed ad nauseum. We timed it out. I mean, it was really great television. I, 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 I loved working for NBC sports. Wow. And, and I would do it again in a minute, but you know, to, to go and do some of those, those high end events, and, and be able to be either part of the show in, in even the littlest of ways with guys like Doc Emmerich and, uh, you know, Bob Costas and Al Michaels, who yeah. has coined me Dr. Doom. They presented me at the uh, London Olympics one time with a Dr. Doom hat, you know, because Al, Al's kind of got a Al's kind of a closet meteorologist. When he goes out, he tells me when he goes out golfing with his buddies, they ask him about the weather. Al, what's it going to do? What's what? What do I need to dress for today? Of course, I'm like Al, you're in Southern California. I mean, it's the same damn. Thing all the time. What <laughs> it's do you, like Hawaii. Like, it's always I mean, sunny. Well, yeah. Of course, they're asking you that. It's an easy answer, but that's uh, it. Was just great working with them. It was just great. Work. But but I, I don't know. Maybe because I just show up in, in some of the worst weather. They, they've asked me to go out and. Um, cover hurricanes, floods. I've, I've done 98 tropical systems, as I like to call it, because they've either been in depression at landfall, a tropical storm or hurricane. And, um, yeah, I, I never say I want to get to 100, but it's inevitable, right? I mean, we know we're always, always going to have hurricanes and tropical storms, but uh, it's just I, 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 I like to put myself in a position of some of the worst weather. But they're all different. Do you kind of get like a like a high doing that? Like you have an opportunity to you be know what's there. Funny is, is, yeah, I do. I mean, especially when I when I was a kid, when I, you know, because I started the Weather Channel at twenty two. So you know, by about age thirty two, when I when I got out there, and this lady came up to me in Wrightsville Beach when I was covering Hurricane Dennis, and she goes, "You know what, Jim?" And I could see her too. She looked petrified, but she walked up to me through a, a bunch of people, and and I, and I said ma'am, can I help you with something? And she goes, yeah, I just wanted to tell you, um, you know, we, we know it's going to get bad here, but I just wanted you to know that we're glad that you're here to take us through it. Oh, wow. You know, it was a really interesting moment in my life, especially as a meteorologist, because all of a sudden it wasn't about the swashbuckling through a storm anymore. It was more of a, God, you know, I, I, I got purpose here. I mean, I, I got to, I had a way to communicate with these people, get them out of harm's way and, and really help. And, and that's what that's, I never forgot that moment. Cause that was really the turning point. So Jim, I grew up in uh, Oklahoma and you know, we had oh, tornadoes cool. all the time. And we lived, through, I lived through many, many tornadoes and um, uh, Gary England oh, yeah. is someone like, you oh, know, yeah. we would, we would watch uh, news channel nine and he, and he you know, we felt like he saved our life, you know, or we felt, you know, he, we knew to get cover if Gary was talking about it. And, you know, out here in, in Louisville, Kentucky, I feel like they start getting all panicky if there's, you know, one cumulus cloud in the air. It, it, is there a, you know, are there's are there like some meteorologists who just have, have the chops, some who are just a little bit more panicky? I mean, you're brave and you go into anything, but I feel like some of them, you know, well, I'm going to be honest with you. There's, there's probably things that, uh, none of us should be in, frankly. Um, it's your job. It's your mission as a meteorologist to relay the message, to get people out of harm's way and to not panic yourself. Because if you, if that is your, <laughs> if, they, if that's what they see in you, 
they're not going to listen to you. Okay. There, there needs to be a sense of calm. There needs to be a sense of, of control over going through this. It's not going to last forever. Most people will make it through it. Sadly, some will not. That is just the way of the world when it comes to a strong tornado. Uh, we don't, I mean, we hate that. We, we, as meteorologists, we love the tornadoes that are way out in the open plains. They're over, you know, pasture land that hasn't been farmed yet. That, that doesn't bother anybody. They don't take out any buildings. They don't hurt anybody. Those are, those are the beautiful ones to admire from a distance. But the ones that start coming through town, when you start seeing a debris shield and cloud come up and you start seeing pieces of building and metal flying all around, you know, you, you, your, your, your heart drops your stomach a little bit because, you know, now you're in an area where there's population. When you start seeing power flashes, um, you know, you, you know that somebody's in harm's way. Hopefully everybody got out of that, but you know there's a chance. And, and we're about to, interestingly enough, I mean, I don't know when this is going to play, uh, the, the podcast we're doing here, but we're about to enter a period of a really daily tornadoes in, in Tornado Alley, traditional Tornado Alley, Fred, where you're from. Yeah. So it's going to get it's going to get really busy starting Friday out there, and it's going to yeah. last through at least the end of the month. Man, that's uh, – yeah, it, it's it's such a somber – Feeling because I know, I mean, growing up in an area where people died, you know, from from a tornado, and then you know that's happened here in Kentucky and Indiana as well. It's just, right. you know, I, you know, I think a lot of people just look at the TV and see you all as like personalities, but you really, you really do feel vested in in the people's lives out there. It's, that's not just talking. You know what's really interesting is, is you know, I've worked at the Weather Channel for 33 plus years, and I've never really considered it a day that I have to go to work. Oh, you know, is it hard to get up at 3:15 in the morning? You bet. But it's hard for me to get up at 9 a.m. So 3:15. <laughs> so, but but the the fact that I I I this is a service. This is always going to be a service at the end of the day, and that's what makes it great. And it never gets old that way. That's how I look at it. And when you come home, when you sell it, when you're celebrating um, for like a, a job well done, like you know, finding a, a storm cloud or finding you know a pocket of um, you know that and saving someone's life, you know, via the Weather Channel. What are you drinking when you get home to celebrate, or at a bar? The first thing I do is. Uh, if he's, yeah. if he's getting up at 315, he's probably going to bed around no, 7 I mean, is what it sounds you know, like. So. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you guys. I mean, a lot of times there's not celebration. I mean, it's you, you're coming back. You're literally dragging coming in the door because yeah. you're working long hours. You've witnessed hundreds of people that have gone through death and destruction. They've lost everything that, they're, that they own, that they know. Um, you, you're out there. Again, like I told you, it's your mission to tell these stories, to let the rest of the country know what's happened here and get these people as much help as they can get. So when you come home, there's a little PTSD. All right. Uh, you got to deal with this. You, you got to, you got to let it go. And I like to go up to my lake house uh, in Lake Blue Ridge, Georgia. I love it. The water, the, the, the mountains. I grew up in Appalachia. I love it. Uh, the, being in the South, it's just a Southern extent of the same mountain chain I grew up on and you can let everything go there. And after that, uh, you can sit back and you can say, okay, what did I do good? What did I do bad? How could I have improved upon what I've done? Um, who who else could I have helped? What else could I have said before the event that may have helped people? Uh, those are the kind of things that, you know, sitting out by the fire with uh, uh, a little bit of Willits or McKenna. Or, oh, you're speaking Fred's language now. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, now I, I know he's like, I know he likes these. I've seen his, I, I follow him on Instagram. And when I see Fred show a picture of, of these, uh, you know, these bottles, I'm like, oh man, this is perfect. I'm right on board. Cause if Fred likes it, it's gotta be good. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, like, you know, I can feel that um, emotion, you know, coming from you. And <laughs> I, I just got to tell you, you, you know, know, man, you, 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 yeah. you've been on mission in your life. You know what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, it, it's right. You know, uh, it's very different, but it's like, you know, there's got to be pockets of what you do, though, where you do find a moment to celebrate. I mean, because you, you and your colleagues have found storms and saved people's lives, 
you know, and there might have been one or two or, you know, some. So do you get moments to to celebrate or is it always a feeling of like you, you want to know in the moments to celebrate? Let me give you an example. So the other day, yesterday, actually, in the morning, I go in and <clears throat> the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, puts out all sorts of forecasts. And one of the things they put out are severe weather outlooks from day four through eight. And what they'll do is if something meets a, a certain probability, they will color in these different areas where severe weather may strike. So I'm looking at their new day four through eight and I'm like, holy smoke, day four, five, six, seven, and eight are all colored in. I've never seen that before. They must have done that before. No, actually, I don't think they have. So I get on Twitter and I send them a tweet and ask them if they've ever done that before. And sure enough, I, so I started saying it on the air, you know, hey, guys, I actually think this is the first time that that the Storm Prediction Center has outlooked at day four through eight. And it was it, it just turned out to be that it was it was the first time that they've done that. So, you know, what that does for me is, OK, he he he's passionate about the weather. He's locked into his craft to, to be able to recognize that after the God knows how many outlooks that they've put out here over the years. I mean, that, that was kind of a cool moment for me. Okay. So if that, if that's, if that's a way to celebrate, then, then so be it yesterday. I, I just remembered that. Um, we can find as many yeah, small that's... celebrations to drink as we want. I mean, it's, it's easy. <laughs> True. And in fact is, you know, Kenny and I, you know, this is, since this is what we do for a living, you know, we, we just celebrate celebrating. So we were looking for something to toast with you on. So here, here, <laughs> cheers, cheers to, to well, the guys, uh, that's a celebrate to uh, day four through eight from SBC. Those guys do a wonderful job. And, you know, that's the other thing, too. A lot of people don't realize, you know, you see me on the air. Uh, you don't realize how many people are behind the scenes at the Weather Channel, how many meteorologists I converse with, how many people are in my ear like Greg Diamond. Hey, Cantor, you know, this is, uh, you know, Oklahoma City just got one point five inches of rain in the last 20 minutes. Boom, there's a great stat for me. I throw it on the air. Uh, you know, great Twitter followers like Ryan Maui and Eric Blake from the Hurricane Predict. I, I, it, it's endless. It's endless, uh, which is why I, I kind of I, I like Twitter. It's kind of our weather pre- weather enterprise home. Um, but just wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful information, information, wonderful knowledge gathering from all these people. And, and, and Fred, you probably see that. You probably see that from comments on IG. You probably see this. You know, I've seen you with with old timers that have have been through the business. Uh, you know, you, you you sit there and you spend a few moments with them, and it may not be on Twitter, but it's actually in real life, sitting next to them talking, and you kind of pick up a little something. Yeah, and it just it just helps the whole cause, right? At the end of the day, so. And and, and Kenny, oh. I, I would say like, um, you know, the the weather industry is 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 relatively new in terms of like um, you know the American you know, scene, but, uh, I, I would say Jim would probably be on the, the Mount Rushmore of, um, of weather <laughs> professionals, That's you know, if, and, and, uh, you know, our, our colleague, I Ryan, think all guys on Mount Rushmore have hair. Fred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a new one. You know, I'm interested to see that, how they do that. It's just a very, they have to sand, actually they have to sand down the heads. They can't chisel them out. <laughs> you know, that just means the, the wind and the rain will do that. That'll do it. That just means they're going to get your cranium better. Hey. You know, to be a better composite, but uh, you know, you know, Jim, you've also you've got some other interests. You're a big fan of cars, and you got you got some stuff there behind you. Tell us, tell us about the wall behind you there, all the cool. Well, what's what's interesting about the stuff behind me is I'm, I'm a big Yankee fan. Okay, and the NHRA, which the dragsters you see behind me there, um, they actually you know, the Yankees sponsored one of their a couple of their cars, mm-hmm. and you know, you can see those those dragsters. Let me see my. Let's go up a little bit. There we go. So you've got that going on. Back back in the day, in terms of NASCAR, um, I was a big Bobby Labonte fan. Bobby kind of reached out to me, and I went and watched him win the 2000 season um, with wow. his crew at Joe Gibbs Racing. I mean, that was awesome. But there probably isn't any sport <laughs> that's more impacted by the weather than, than race car driving. I mean, you can't you – can't, Unless you're, you know, driving an Indy car, it's going to be heavily impacted, certainly by uh, by the weather. I mean, every, how they tune the engine. Obviously, with slicks, you're not driving around a wet track. 
uh, even a couple of drops of rain makes that slippery track even slipperier. So there's all sorts of things that, uh, that certainly impact, especially NASCAR. Now, I, th- I see the footballs behind you, and you talk about it, sports being impacted yeah. by weather. And I know this is really old news, but I, I think a lot of our listeners are, are probably football fans. Was the Deflate Gate was that was that a hoax? Was that is that <laughs> real? Could, could could you really All right, lose? So, so uh, here's the deal. Even though I'm <laughs> from New England, um, I am actually a huge Packers fan because we went up and did a story on you know. Green Bay, playing in Green Bay. And this is before they made the new warmed up fields at Soldier Field and Lambeau. Back in the day, in the winter up there, it was like playing on cement, okay? Yeah. When you took a hit, you f- it was like taking a hit on pavement. That's what it was like, here, okay? And there, were, and there weren't these specialty pads and these warmers. I mean, these, ta- these guys were out there. In, are you the saying practice. players today are soft? They're a bunch of wussies. The whole world's getting a little soft, but that's beside the point. Um, but the, the, the point is, is that I, I we, we went up there to Green Bay. And I'll never forget this guy. His name is Red Batty. He was equipment manager. And he right when we walked in, he was so friendly and so wonderful. He took us right into the equipment room. He started handing out sweats, and socks and hats. Because it was cold. The story we were going to do, it was cold. Because you may need a, a few of these extra layers. And, and just kind of being around Green Bay for the whole four days was incredible. I, I'm walking through the, you know, Tafar's getting taped up in the in the tape room or whatever it is, or the prep room, but to go out and do practice. And he looks over at me. He goes, hey, you're that, uh, you're that, uh, you're that weather guy, right? Sure, you love yeah, that yeah. one, too. Yeah, yeah. that's me. And this is, I'm thinking to myself, holy smokes, this is freaking Brett Favre. And so I'm like, How, what do I say to that? So I look wow. back at him and I say, you know what? Hey, you're that, uh, <laughs> you're that, uh, you're that, what, that, that quarterback guy. <laughs> so he just laughed and it just went, but it was just so down to earth. There was nothing pretentious. It was just this wonderful town that owns this wonderful team with a tremendous winning tradition. Uh, how could you not be a Green Bay, Pack- Green Bay Packers fan? Unless you're a Vikings fan. I get it. But th- really, and the, f- the first game we went to, here I am down on the field, and it's freezing rain. I'm, I, my flight gets canceled, okay, from, from, um, from Minneapolis to, to Green Bay. And I'm like, oh, no. So I'm, dri- I'm like, screw it. I'm driving. So I'm driving through a nice storm, and I finally make it there. It's the fourth quarter. Uh, they, they tie up the game. The Packers tie up the game. And then you remember the Antonio Freeman catch off his helmet? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, I was on the sidelines in that game. Oh, wow. I, I was just unbelievable. The, the passion of the fans, the just ever, the, nobody left. And it's, dude, it's 35 degrees freezing rain. It's brutal out there. And so now it's in overtime for this game. And so I, I never forgot that. Never forgot that. It's a incredible so, story. Packers, man. So Deflate Gate. Was that- so yeah, <laughs> You've probably heard of finishing beer using whiskey barrels, but a Michigan distillery is doing the opposite. They're using beer barrels to finish their whiskey. New Holland Spirits claims to be the first distillery to stout a whiskey. The folks at Rackhouse Whiskey Club heard that claim and had to visit the banks of Lake Michigan to check it out. It all began when New Holland Brewing launched in 97. Their Dragon's Milk Beer is America's number one selling bourbon barrel aged stout. In 2005, they applied their expertise from brewing and began distilling. A beer barrel finished whiskey began production in 2012, and Rackhouse Whiskey Club is featuring it in their next box. The barrels come from Tennessee, get filled with Dragon's Milk Beer twice, the mature bourbon is finished in those very same barrels. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories from craft distillers across the U.S. Along with two bottles of hard-to-find whiskey, Rackhouse's boxes are full of cool merchandise that they ship out every two months to members in over 40 states. Go to RackhouseWhiskeyClub.com to check it out and try a bottle of Beer Barrel Bourbon and Beer Barrel Rye. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. So deflate gate. Was that- so yeah, back to the plate uh, so, so as you yeah, you keep deflecting that one off. Let's yeah, get back I to the real juice here. Uh, you know, Robert Kraft in Florida or anything. So I'm glad you kept it at the flake gate. Uh, you know, hey, it, it it is what it is. But how do you you know how do you use the weather to realize that you know 
what happens in the, on a cold winter's night? You go, you start your car, you start driving. And if you have one of these newer cars, it tells you your tire pressure went down. That's because of the cold air. So, so Tom Brady was right, or they were, they were right. Their study was right. It's exactly right. So. Uh, so, uh, let's, let's stay a little bit on, on the weather. Some, some weird kind of questions. Like I have friends who tell me that their knees hurt and that means yeah. there's a thunderstorm coming. Is that real? Yeah. The pressure changes can affect people. Um, kind of cranks up the arthritis a little bit. Uh, the, the, sometimes the humidity, sometimes the moisture in the air, the cold damp. Uh, yeah, I, I totally believe it. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anything. It's one of these things, Fred, that in Kenny, it's, it's not super scientific, I don't think there's any cut rule on it because it because everybody's body's different. They're affected differently. I mean, one guy's low pressure may not be another guy's or gal's. All right. It's different, but it's it's definitely there. I've heard it enough to say we've got the evidence. We've got the circumstantial evidence. That's very interesting. In, in American whiskey, we are um, – we Fred, are. Fred has the same problem. He drinks something. You can feel it in his knee sometimes. Oh, he start, his knees start yeah. Especially when I fall down the stairs. Uh, <laughs> um, when we when we look at like American whiskey, we are very much uh, you know the majority of the distillers are, are a lot of them are using like kind of climate control, but there's some who who are not. Um, and it comes up a lot about you know, is this, is climate change going to have an impact on, on American whiskey? And really, you know, I think the, the, the verdict's out, but the, the one thing that we're facing a lot of right now in Kentucky is, is the rain and, and like the okay. constant flooding, you know? All right. So here's what I'm going to say to that. Um, we grow a lot of corn in this country. The corn belt is very well known, uh, you know, from the Midwest up through the, uh, you know, across the Great Lakes and into uh, the, the High Plains. Um, they've gotten soaked this year. They're going to get soaked over the next couple of days. So that certainly delays corn. But if let, let's just say that we warm the planet by two degrees and, and now we open up all these growth areas in Canada. So now, so now you extend your growth area up into Canada. And, you know, that... D- d- I think we'll always be able to grow corn is my point. We'll grow it somewhere. We'll get it from somewhere. Does, um, does like increased, uh, water impact a kind of a microclimate of, a of an area? Cause what we're seeing is we're seeing the waters rise around like distilleries, like the rivers are getting higher. Yes. The lakes are getting higher. Yes. How will that impact, uh, like warehouses and stuff like on a kind of like a, a map? That's my climate? biggest concern is, you know, when you look at a warmer atmosphere, you can hold more water molecules, all right? And it's the same physics that are squeezing them out. But if you got more to squeeze out, you're going to squeeze out more. And, and so it's raining harder. It really is. We're finding, finding these just prolific rainfall events, uh, double-digit rainfall totals, you know. And, and ask the folks in Houston. They got – Houston, we got a problem, okay, because they're yeah. getting these things all the time now. So imagine being a city versus – you know, farmland where, where you can take certainly a little bit more water, but that is the problem. It, 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 it's raining harder. Uh, that is not good because it's raining at rates that the soil can't absorb the moisture. And, and so we're it also, runs off and it runs off rich, fertile soil. And, and so you're changing the landscape, you're changing the fertility of the soil. And that's a big deal. That, that, that's something we're that also, we have to keep an eye on for sure. There's also maybe a concern like the right now the uh, the white oak forest of uh, the eastern part of the United States seems to be fine, but if this rain keeps up, you know it's it's surely going to get down to the roots of a lot of those uh, white oak trees. You know what's interesting? The, the yeah the the white oaks seem to be doing okay at the moment. Um, what I've noticed though are the red oaks are very susceptible to drought and heat and cold. They're very finicky. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of rot in the middle. There's a lot of broken limbs. They just don't look healthy, especially Mm -hmm. with more water. For example, uh, Blairsville, Georgia got uh, 100 inches of rain last year, which is unprecedented. I'm going to be interested to see as we go through the next few years what impact that has on the oaks. I actually have, uh, you know, a property where I took down 
a bunch of red oaks because they were a threat to to a homestead. And I couldn't believe what I saw in there. Me, me and my buddy were like, when we cut this tree down, we're like, holy smoke, the whole middle of it's rotted. <laughs> it was going to wow. fall anyway. I'm like, thank God we took that down. So wow. now I'm looking for other red oaks that may need to come down uh, because of the same problem. So there's something going on uh, with the oak. And, and yes, Fred, do, 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 you know, animals and plants know or have a hint of what's happening before we do as humans. I think that's possible. I really do. Uh, so it's, when you it's look at the last season, the red oaks right now, when you look at red oaks versus white oak, here's a little kind of a fun, like bourbon historical fact. The distillers actually figured out like red oak, uh, that kind of stuff happened to red oak and it wouldn't retain water when they uh, turned them into barrels. And so that's one of the big reasons why the majority of the barrels are made from Quercus alba, you know, a species of uh, of white oak. But white uh, oak, yeah, yeah. But it, you know, red oak so is uh, is the is the red oak has always been the weaker species. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, Jim, I've got a kind of question for you too. When we're talking about you know the weather paint, the weather changes and everything shifting, and Fred might be able to kind of talk about this too because you know living here in Kentucky. We hear all the time that, oh, yeah, this is the best climate for bourbon, uh, the cold winters, the warm summers. However, the past two or three winters here have been pretty mild. Uh, you know, we've had maybe one school closure, two inches of mm -hmm. snow, and that's it. I mean, we're not talking, you know, weeks upon weeks of like severe cold weather. Are you seeing any kind of like climate changes or shifting that's happening, at least in our part of the country, where we could expect this sort of happening for years to come that could even affect future stocks. I mean, guys, there's no question in the last 30 years or so, which is a, you know, a val viable climate record. Uh, we've seen warming, especially in the Arctic regions. Um, there's no, you know, we've measured that. It's the same instruments have measured that warming. So it, it, it's definitely there. Uh, what's interesting, though, is people need to realize, though, it's not just warm. <laughs> when, when, when you get an overall warming and other things are going on, it, it can lead to other extremes. In other words, uh, how many record warm Februaries and Marches have we had? And then all of a sudden to snap into a cold blast in April and have record lows. So it's these kind of zigzaggy, really extreme undulations of the jet stream that I, I, we haven't quite figured out. Is that is that something because of now what is used to be so much ice over the Arctic, uh, more dark areas that are absorbing heat and maybe changing the overall jet stream? There's a, there's, there's a lot of speculation here. And there's just a lot of stuff we don't know, all right? Um, is this a short-term trend? Can the Earth correct itself? Are humans playing a part? I certainly think, you know, with the amount of, you, you're talking about what, seven billion uh you know, Probably yes to all the above. Yeah. Quite a few billion people out there, you know, certainly impacting things. I do hate that all of this gets politicized because I think if we looked at it from a, a purely scientific perspective, we, we, we could analyze it a, a, a little better. But what happens, everything gets politicized and you get one side going for the other and then one side denies it and the other side fights back. It just, I feel like we're, you know, the, the, the climate you know, change yeah. conversation is at a disservice due to political. It's, it's very sad because the, the ends of the spectrum, the deniers and the, and the alarmists are the loudest. Okay. Uh, it's the majority in the middle that are willing to listen and do something and be good stewards of their planet that are kind of open to all, you know, Hey, okay, I'll listen to you. I'll listen to you. You know what? Yeah. Maybe I could recycle better. Maybe I can drive an electric car. You know, people that genuinely want to be good stewards of the planet. I, I, I think that really needs to be. I agree. And, and, and don't you think in, in this wonderful world that we live in with so much ingenuity that we will figure out stuff? I yeah. mean, look, look at Tesla. Look, you know, look at Elon Musk, Elon Musk and the Tesla. Just a great idea. But sometimes with solutions come problems. What do you do with the batteries? <laughs> you know, when, when, when the cars are dead, you know, that's a lot of, that's a big chunk of, of waste right there. Uh, you know, right now when we look over the oceans, uh, I was reading something the other day, we have, especially over the Pacific, 
the, the, the plastic gyre is now four times the size of France. Whether that's true or false, I'm just telling you, I read it. That's a big deal. <laughs> okay. We, we, we can't have that kind of plastic over the ocean. We need, we need to fix that. That is not being a good steward to your planet. And, 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 bo- and before we worry about these other things, we need to fix that. We need to, we need to get a handle on that. And then we can start dealing with the other stuff because that's what uh, humans do. We figure stuff out. Now, this is a real, that's a really great segue into uh, a moment when you and I actually picked out a barrel together uh, oh, and, and how we figured something out. So, um, that I can't use a hundred year old drill. Is that, yeah. what, is that where you're going with this? Brett? So let me, let me paint the picture for, for, you, for you the a, to, yeah. audience. This is cause it's, we're, we're at the barbecue uh, competition and, and it's the party and um, we're with Stormy Warren and a, and a couple other uh, folks. Of course, you know, Stormy has his own uh, Sirius XM, you know, uh, station and we are great guy. Great yeah. guy. Uh, also, him. also a cowboy, you know, go pokes. Yeah. Um, you got to throw it in there, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Go pokes. Uh, so we, um, you know, I, I'm with uh, the assistant master distiller, uh, Chris Fletcher. And, you know, he's giving us a tour. And I say, Chris, let's uh, let's taste some barrels. And he's like, oh, well, you know, we don't really do that. You know, I said, Chris. Let's taste some barrels. Look at you. It's me. It's All Fred. Right. Let's taste Come some barrels. On. So, seriously, Kenny, you got to go back here. I mean, you know Fred well. He's literally drilling this guy. Yeah. All right. And I and I in the, in the way that he, we got it done was Fred literally going back and telling stories on the stories from this d- distiller. He was kind of one upping the distiller almost every story that would, and I'm just like, who is this guy? This is this guy's <laughs> unbelievable. And so that's it. I mean, he just knows everything about bourbon and the history of Jack Daniels. I'm like, this is unbelievable. So he couldn't say no to Fred. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead, Fred. I sorry, I I I, 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 well, I know no, and I got to tell you, I I don't like. I don't like doing that, and and it, and it <laughs> it's never like it's you. never like <laughs> super intentional. But you know the these these brands, these distilleries, they just they have their like marketing spiel and their like their templates yeah, and right, their right. speeches. I, I and, and I just like you know when they say something like you know we were the first sour mash or something like that, I'm going to be like, well, actually, in 1818, <laughs> you know. Um, and um and, and it's not their fault it's just it's it's marketing but uh i no dude but I'm, I'm telling you you had to be there because i'm just like who is this guy <laughs> i mean he knows everything i'm like this is unbelievable like were you were you, it wasn't like there was everything where you like he's being a dick because he knows everything it, it wasn't like hesitation it was kind of like hold on a second i, I mean just in, off the top of his head and he would just come out with these incredibly beautiful stories like only fred can tell uh, you know and it's just like ooh, i want i want to hear what he has to say so the distiller could not say no when it came to open anyway go ahead absolutely the, and, the, and we then did a single barrel go ahead we we were uh we, we got the the chance to crack open some barrels and then, then it came down to like well which barrels do we want to go to and i said well let's go you know let's 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 find the ones that have the best age on them and, uh, and so we went into the, one, one of the warehouse, I don't recall the warehouse, but it was, it, you could tell it was, it was paring down. It was like a little skinnier. There weren't as many barrels in there. And, uh, um, so it was obviously one that, that they were pulling for their single barrel program. So this was an allocated single barrel warehouse, whatever warehouse that might've been. And then he comes up with this fucking drill, like most <laughs> will it, will it, and all these other distillers have like a real drill. You know, Jack Daniels comes oh, up with this God. like hand crank drill with like a <laughs> knob on there. It was the one from uh, who's the original distiller for Jack Daniels? Well, who, or the well, headmaster that we, the uh, nearest green or uh, uh, Lim Motlau, Dan Cole. Um, it, Jack it's Daniels. over 100 years old. Let's just put it that way. It was. It, I mean, seriously, it was old. I mean, maybe it had like years old, probably. What do you think? It, it was old. I, I can't. It did look like something that uh, they like would have had like on American the American Pickers of, kind of thing. It would have been on the set of Deadwood. It was that old, and True. and they 
they come in here and it's got like this this handle where you kind of you hold it and then you crank it over here and the drill bit the drill bit actually looks like it's like somebody forged it with a hammer i mean the the, the drill bit looks like ancient right. so like it, so as old as it was they could have at least replaced a drill bit i don't think they did anyway so no, jim either. gets in there and he's drilling the damn thing just disappears. <laughs> <laughs> he he loses the drill bit in there. Like in the in the barrel. In yes. the barrel. Yes. So I'm cranking this thing. Think about an old crank. And I'm holding it and cranking it. And all of a sudden it just pops out of the drill. I'm like, oh sh-. and it's stuck in the barrel. It's stuck in the barrel. And of course, I'm you know, I'm not the laughing stock. <laughs> well, we did we were all laughing, but you were also uh now, Stormy did try to drill, and uh, Kyle tried to drill a little bit, too. But you were the only one who had any kind of muscle. You know, I mean, if you t- take a look at Jim. I mean, that, that boy is ripped. You know, he's got the biceps. He's got the deltoids. He works uh, out. Yeah, okay, so the true story here is that, 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 that Stormy and Kyle were too drunk to drill. So I had to take over. <laughs> That's really where the story – go ahead, pick it up. From and you. I you're, would, just, you're just playing catch-up at this point. Uh, no, I mean, he really had the umph to it. But so, so, all right, so that one, that drill didn't work out. And lo and behold – Jack Daniels didn't have just one like 1895 <laughs> drill. They had two drills from 1895. And and Chris comes marching up with this this second drill, but this one even looks older. You can tell yes. that they haven't been using yes. it. It's got and dust the, on it. And the bit is even more wear down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right, sir. And he gets in there. Yeah, you know, Jim's going along, and that one gets stuck in there. So yeah. But so you uh, so you owe Jack Daniels two artifacts is what we're saying. Get to the good part though. Where we we're drinking finally it. We got in. We finally got in, and then we start drinking. We, then there were like, um, how many barrels did we end up tapping? We end up tapping like two, five barrels. Two or three, right? I remember five. Wow. Okay. And we and actually, Jim, I don't know if you know this, but the barrel that we like the most, they actually bottled it for a charity that I support, the Kentucky Brain Injury Alliance. I can. Uh, the Brain Injury Alliance of Kentucky, and um, and the Home Ride Foundation for uh, for vets. So they end wow, up selling it, doing that's yeah. fantastic. So since we've just beaten up Jack Daniels a little bit, no, not I really. Just their te- drill. I want you to tell everybody <laughs> what happened once we got a sip of the, either the first or second barrel, and and the oh. distiller looks at you, Fred, and he says, Fred. What would you give this? Or maybe it was Stormy who said it. I can't remember who said it to you, but. Yeah, no, I definitely said it was like mid-90s or something. I thought it was. Uh, you said 92. 92. Good memory. But no. it was it was like uh, an incredible, uh, complicated whiskey. I've got a bottle of it in here in the office somewhere. But uh, it is, uh, I, I still, you know, Jack Daniels gets, gets a bad rap for, you know, for just kind of being an everyday like mixer with Coke. But you know, that's what pays the bills. The fact is right. they have some incredible barrels in there. And if, if you can get a single, if you can drink straight from the Jack Daniels barrels and I'd put that whiskey up against anything in Kentucky, there's a lot of great whiskey in those warehouses. You know, what's really interesting is, is it for people who haven't been to Jack Daniels? Um, I think the weather actually helps them. Because it's almost like a little tropical rainforest back there. I mean, it's just so humid. You know, you, you can't help but think whatever this whiskey is sitting in is not going to pick up whatever is in that barrel and take a part of it. And that's where the magic happens, right? Yeah. Jim, I guess a question for you about humidity in general. I mean, what, what's that actually doing, do you think, to barrels? I mean, Ryan was, who couldn't be on the show tonight, he's one of our other co-hosts. He was talking about like barometric pressure. Like does, does humidity help with something like that? Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned barometric pressure because I got a buddy. His name is Paul Menta. Um, he is a rum distiller in Key West, Florida. First, uh, first legal rum. And he basically plays the barometric pressure. And that's when he distills his rum when the pressure drops. So he uses the pressure as a part of his game. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's really, really interesting. 
Um, but certainly, you know, I, I don't know how that works in terms of pressure, but I know humidity, certainly when you add moisture to wood, it swells, uh, it opens up the wood. So maybe it brings out more of the flavor of the wood into the bourbon or the whiskey. Who knows? Well, so maybe, I, maybe when you retire from the weather channel, you could go and take a side gig at some of these distilleries and kind of just do more research I on, the, that on the weather is, of barrels. I think that is simply brilliant. I love that idea. You know, Kenny, I was actually about to say that, you know, um, I'll take 5%. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need, we need to go at this together, guys. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, we're a team here. Come on. Well, you know, Kenny does bottle his own whiskey. So, you know, that's, uh, there well, is that's that. Pretty impressive right there. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, they're, they're making a go at it. It's called the Pursuit Series. And now he's going to send you a few bottles. Isn't that right, Kenny? It, twist my arm. We can make it happen. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so Jim, man, I got to tell you, um, the, the, just the, the bourbon world, it, it does need a face and weather. You know, we need, we need someone who can be the bourbon face and the weather world. Are you up for it? Are you willing to take that channel Ch- uh, uh, channel challenge? I am, you know, as, as I kind of get, uh, a little bit older and, you know, all the young kids start taking over in the, in the weather world. Um, yeah, maybe it's time to maybe it's time to switch guns to bourbon. Let's do it. I well, can think of worse things. I, I got to tell you, it, it's been a it's been a real pleasure, uh, you know, just being your friend, but also having you on. And um, you know, cheers to you, my friend, and everything that you Thanks, do brother. for uh, for America. I Absolutely, you. and I you know, I you. I know we'll be more than happy to be your agent, and you know, make sure you we talk to the right distilleries <laughs> for you. We'll make that happen. Well, guys, if um. After we play this and, and and the Weather Channel looks at it and says, you know, Cantor, are you, are you promoting liquor on uh, on, a, on a podcast? That's we, we don't think we're we're going to breach your contract. I, I may need you guys. So we'll, we'll, well see what happens. Here's the here's the good news is that spirits advertise a lot and you can just spin that as saying like, well, actually, I got a line over here. You know, they may want to advertise. Oh, contract's good. I was about to say, I was like, this is your opportunity right now to say, like, what's your go to? Because all of a sudden the, the contracts are going to start rolling in. Yeah, well, we're going to hold off on that. Um, we're we're <laughs> just going to let you, you guys put, put together kind of a magic case uh, and something will arrive in the mail and we'll, we'll see what happens. I, and I know Fred's certainly been trying to get me to try some different things um, and they're good. They're, well, <laughs> when, when a package comes in the mail from Fred, it's like, woo, we need to go here. You know, and but there's dude, more here's to what we need to do from now on. Send me the package and tell me what you're sending me before you put it out on social media. Because once it goes out on social media, then you can't get it anymore. You, you know, know how hard I, it is to get McKenna right now because of you. You know how hard it is to get McKenna right now. The minic yeah. effect. He 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 kills all of us. I I, I mean no ill will, f- people. <laughs> <laughs> no ill will. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thanks, guys. Cheers, brother. Till next Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah, Until and thank time. you, Jim. Thank you so much for for coming on the show today. Uh, you know, Fred as well for for coming on and making sure that you know able to bring Jim because I think we got a lot of great information in regards of not only just Jim's past and his history, his family kind of having a connection to the distributing business as well, and really what you know I guess how whiskey's making an impact in your life now too as well. So it, it's fantastic just to know that that kind of personal side with you uh and before we kind of close off you know jim i want you to just give an opportunity to let people know like how they can follow you on social media and how they can find you uh just in that regard as well guys i mean here's how i run my social media uh at jim cantore is all business uh all weather uh on twitter um facebook gets all those those tweets uh at jim cantore on on instagram is more like who is this guy outside of weather? You know, what does he do? Where does he go? Who's he hang out with? What, you know, what's what's going on with his kids? You know, with with fragile X syndrome, um, the Parkinson's that my ex wife uh, is dealing with. So you know, those kind of things. The the the, the other storms in my life. You'll find on. I'll tell life. everyone right now. Jim is an amazing man, an amazing man, and you can see a little bit of that on Instagram. And I hope you all go check it out. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm just a man, and I appreciate being that guy. So, uh, if other people can find find a little laugh through through my Instagram or Twitter, uh, Facebook, whatever, enjoy it. Enjoy it. 
Absolutely. And we'll make sure to put that in our show notes for anybody able to go and quickly link to it and be able to follow you as well. Thanks, make sure man. you also follow Bourbon Pursuit, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you like the show, help support the show, patreon.com. And if you like what you hear, make sure you submit any sort of suggestions. We love hate mail. We love fan mail, whatever it is, team at bourbonpursuit.com. So with that, Jim, Fred, thanks again for joining today. And we will see everybody next week. Cheers. Till next time, guys. Yeah.